Microsoft just open source WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux, and it definitely sounds like a win for open source, but let's get into some of the reasons that Microsoft would go down this path. And here's the Microsoft WS public repo now. We're gonna be getting back into this in a little bit, but let's talk about the announcement that led to this. As the repo is already available for contribution, in a blog post yesterday titled, The Windows Subsystem for Linux is Now Open Source, the Microsoft team decided to say, today we're very excited to announce the open source release of the Windows subset for Linux. This is a result of a multi-year effort to prepare for this and a great closure to the first ever issued raised on Microsoft WS repo, which is, will this be open source issue number one? That means that the code that powers WSL is now available on GitHub, the Microsoft slash WSL repo, and is open source to the community. You can now download WSL and build it from source and add new fixes, features, and participate in WSL's active development. So this is overall a fantastic announcement. What does the community get from open sourcing WSL? Well, we can finally contribute directly to the code, influencing how we want WSL to show up on our Windows computers and how it actually works, what features we want to bring in from Linux onto Windows, all good things. We also will see faster releases. Now things like debugging and actual distro management and even fixes will come faster as now it's community driven or at least can be community driven. It feels as if Microsoft is listening to its developers, but is that the true reason why? We'll explore this a little bit more but overall, we expect to see more transparency on the project and also hopefully more trust and openness comes with that transparency. Now, I do want to touch on the first ever GitHub issue, which was, will this be open source? And tons of comments here. And today we can officially say it is open source. Here were some of the comments back in April 6, 2016. Hopefully Bash on Windows will be open source. We have no firm plans as yet, but we're not averse to open sourcing some of this tech and some of this tech is important. We'll get into that a little bit later. Hopefully you will be slanted towards open sourcing it with a well-documented internals to get other subsystems like Darwin, BSD, SmartOS, or other systems running on Windows as well, which is a fantastic mention. As it is important to understand what the project looks like in order to interface with Windows if you wanna bring more operating systems and kernels to work under Windows, which is interesting. But now let's pull back the veil and look at how the WSL process works on Windows. But before we do, make sure to smash that like button and subscribe below. You wouldn't want to miss another video like this. YouTube can get finicky. Here's what things look like now that we officially have WSL open sourced. So what does it look like on the Windows side of things? We have the executable WSL, and then we have other executables that were loaded on the system as well that live in the background. WSL creates a process and has communications with the WSL service. We also have other executables and libraries that exist on Windows. So the Debian and Ubuntu executables load a library called the load library function, which communicates through the WSL API to communicate to the service and back and forth. That then goes into the hypervisor socket, which a container or virtual machine exists on the system and is the complete socket which the WS service communicates through the container or virtual machine to do all your operations and then reports back up the tree. Very good. We now know how everything kind of communicates here with a breakdown of what actual functions and, and flow we have here. I'm sure we're going to get better diagrams over the coming weeks as people dive more into the code. This is explained a little further below as it explains how WSL's code is broken up into key main areas, which we have the command line executables that are the entry points. We have the WSL service that starts the WSL VM. We have the Linux init and daemon processes, which are just the binaries that run to provide WSL functionality. And we have file sharing between Windows and WSL using Plan 9's server implementation. So now we're gonna talk about why they open sourced it. A bit of history which is all fine, but I want to talk about why I'm a little skeptical and why this may be in Microsoft's favor in a bit, but let's read their take on this. WSL was first announced at Build back in 2016 and first shipped with Windows 10 anniversary update. At that time, WSL was based on a Pico process provider, LXCore.sys, which enabled Windows to natively run ELF executables and implement system 
calls from Linux inside of the Windows kernel. This eventually became what is known today as WSL1 and which WSL still supports. Over time, it became clear that the best way to provide optimal compatibility with native Linux was to rely on the Linux kernel itself. WSL2 was born and first announced in 2010. As the community behind WSL grew, WSL gained more features such as GPU support, graphical application support via WSLG, and support for SystemD. It eventually became clear that to keep up with the growing community and feature requests, WSL had to move faster, and it shipped separately from Windows. That's why in 2021, we separated WSL from the Windows code base and moved it to our own code base. This new WSL first shipped as version 0.47.1 to the Microsoft Store in July 2021. At that time, only Windows 11 was supported and the package was marked as preview only recommended to users that wanted to experience the latest and greatest of WSL. We continued to develop this new WSL package until it was ready for general availability. That happened November 2022 with WSL 1, which added support for Windows 10 and which was the first stable release of this new WSL. From there, we kept improving WSL with the objective of fully transitioning all users new WSL package away from the WSL component that ship with Windows. Windows 11 24H2 was the first Windows build that moved users from the built-in WSL to the new WSL package. We kept WSL executable in the Windows image so it could download the latest package on demand to make the transition easier. As we kept moving WSL, we eventually hit another milestone, WSL2, which are the three hardest problems in computer science, off by one errors in naming things. WSL2 introduced major improvements such as mirrored networking, DNS tunneling, session zero support, proxy support, firewall support, and more. And that's the milestone we're building on today. At the time of writing this article, WSL 2.5.7 is the latest available version of our nine pages of GitHub releases since 0.47.1 four years ago. So over the years, the claim here is Microsoft has been slowly open sourcing the Windows subsystem for Linux as it outgrew its roots inside of Windows. Open sourcing it clearly now gives it the flexibility and speed of community driven development that it needs in order to keep up with the fast development pace. At least that's what it kind of sounds like from the summary of what we just read. I do want to mention two components which are still not open sourced as time. More than likely because they are too integrated with the Windows kernel and they do not want to back the veil up to show you what's inside of them. We have the LexCore.sys, the kernel side driver that powers WSL1. And then we have the P9RDR.sys and P.dll, which runs the WSL.localhost file system redirection from Windows to Linux. Again, two libraries that seemingly are important to the kernel side driver function which are not released. So we didn't quite get everything, but again, a massive step in the right direction. Now I wanna get into why I'm a little skeptical on this. One is this is an opportunity for a lock-in strategy. They're offering you Linux tools, but on Windows. This only benefits Microsoft, as you can now today set up a virtual machine on your own or dual boot or just core boot Windows yourself on a different computer or storage disk altogether. The only thing that this benefits is Microsoft having you use Windows while being able to access Linux features. There's also free R&D. They admittedly said that they couldn't keep up with features. So now why not let the community build its features? That seems to be a massive win for Microsoft as now they get free development and they get to steer the ship. Don't forget that the repo is still controlled by Microsoft. So they can do whatever they want with the repo at the end of the day but they get free contributions. Also, it really seems like a funnel at the point. We all know the lock-in strategy, and as over the last decade or two, Windows has really seen a drop in the amount of users. I mean, they used to be around 90% of the world's desktop users. Nowadays, it's more like 70 to 75%. That's a real loss. And those users who have jumped ship have gone over to things like Linux as well as Mac OS, but regardless, this funnel probably wants to lead you to using GitHub and or Azure, their cloud service. This is where they want developers moving. So the easier they make the tools to integrate with things like GitHub and Azure, which we all know Linux dominates when it comes to a 
full-fledged and wonderful developer environment. It's just so much easier to develop on Linux with the package manager and simply getting your tool chains and environments set up no problem. All the major tools and contributions seem to be made from Linux anyway, so a lot of developers want to be there. They've gone from fully closed source here in 2016 to opening things up nine years later. Why? Was that the intention from the beginning? Highly doubtful. As we even read it nine years ago, it said, we have no firm plans as of yet, but we're not averse, strange word to use there, to open sourcing some of this tech. While they finally open source things, I remain skeptical of why they've done this. I want your thoughts on this too. Why do you think Microsoft open sources software? Is this for locking in developers? Are they trying to make Windows the best place to run Linux? Do you see no issues with this? Again, let me know. And now let's get into the Windows subsystem for Linux repository. First off, a lot of you I'm sure are interested in what WSL is actually comprised of or what language comprises. it. Here we go. The languages included here are overwhelmingly C++ and C, with 58.2% of the code base being C++ and 37.3% being C. The rest of it is really for build and test processes, but we have C Sharp 1.9%, CMake to build the project one, Python probably for tests if I had to guess, and PowerShell as well, 0.7 respectively, and other makes up 0.2%. And this seemingly all makes sense for WSL as WSL is a low level system component that deals with things like virtualization, networking, memory, device handling. So C++ is really ideal for these performance critical system calls and has higher level of abstractions than C, making it easier to do object oriented programming and design and of course resource management. But where C++ can't perform in things like system call handling, POSIX-like interfaces when interfacing with Linux, they probably mimic a lot of traditional behavior behind a Linux kernel, and that's why some of this code base is written in C. Who knows, maybe some parts of WSL will learn, but even mirror closely to some of the open source Linux kernel development like the glibc code, which is all C. We also know that C is widely used in Windows internals, including their device drivers like NTDLL. So it fits again, that they're using C. I would assume C Sharp is being used because there are some GUI or system tray apps. Think things like installer and upgrader logic, diagnostics and telemetry, likely used for Windows integration. Again, I already mentioned CMake is just the build system logic. We're probably using Python for scripting and automation. PowerShell is probably again scripts for things like Windows environment management. And the other could be JSON, YAML or configuration files. So here's what the breakdown looks like for the source repo. We have hidden folders called GitHub and .pipelines. We have images, or really the assets. Cloud test, which I would think would be validation or continuous integration set up with the cloud. CMake, again, all the build. Diagnostics are going to be tools or services for tracing and debugging WSL. Distributions, code for managing different Linux distributions. Docs, that's self-explanatory. Other interesting ones are, of course, source, test, and tools. Let's look into the source folder. In source, we have Linux shared and Windows. By going into Linux, we have includes, init, mount utilities, network link utilities, and plan nine. Then we check out the network link utility, and we can see we have different types of addressing interfaces and all sorts of files that have to do with networking. Overall, the project really has a great structure. A massive project like this can get very overwhelming, but spending some time and just looking over things, I gotta give it to them, they've kept it very organized. I wonder how long it's taken them to get there. Now, I wouldn't be finished without talking about privacy and telemetry. Of course, Microsoft has some sort of telemetry built in. The application logs basic diagnostic data telemetry. For more information on privacy and what we collect, see our data and privacy documentation. The software may collect information about you and your use of software. Why in the world would it gather information about you? Whatever. And send it to Microsoft. Microsoft may use this information to provide services and improve our products and services. You may turn off the telemetry as described in the repository. There are also some features in the software that may enable you and Microsoft to collect data from users of your applications if you use some of these features, you must comply with the applicable law, including providing appropriate notices to your users of your applications, together with a copy of Microsoft's privacy statement. Our privacy statement is located here. You can learn more about the data collection and use it in help documentation 
in our privacy statement. Your use of the software operates as your consent to these practices. As you would expect, it feels very generalized, this statement here, as Microsoft's telemetry disclosure here uses just boilerplate legal jargon that seemingly covers all use cases, not just WSL. It seems vague on specifics, as you would expect, written in for liability and not clarity, and just feels like it's a copy-pasted type of language. What else is expected from Microsoft? Of course, they're going to include telemetry. It would be fantastic to see a fork spawned off of all this code that removes all the telemetry from the code. Maybe we'll see that in the coming months and weeks, but as of now, it seems like there's telemetry built in which can gather all sorts of data. It's just kind of funny that they open source this thing and it feels like you're not using an open dev tool. Instead, you're using something that Microsoft packages its telemetry upon and you're working on this project in order to just keep pushing that telemetry. Anyways, it's not surprising, but it is surprising that Microsoft would open source WSL. If you are a Linux developer on Windows, this is your opportunity to shape the tool behind that integration. We'll see if this is a strategic plan or in the mind of openness and goodwill. But to generalize some of my thoughts, I think one, this is a way to win over extra developers. Two, this will reduce R&D costs and put the burden onto the open source community. Three, they want to maintain relevance in a Linux first world where Linux dominates dev. Four, it seems like Windows is trying to deepen its workflows into the lives of open source and devs. And of course, it wouldn't be surprising if Microsoft's plan here is to try and improve its cloud and tool chain lock-in in an effort to make more money. Anyways, I would love to hear what you think about this all in the comments section below. If you haven't already, subscribe below, smash that like button for me, catch me in a great community on Discord, and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching. Linux can be hard to understand, but I take the most commonly used terms, commands, and subjects in Linux and I break them down into simple to read documents, including Linux terms, flashcards, a checklist, a cheat sheet, and a mind map. And if you're ready to level up your Linux experience and knowledge, go to SavvyNick.com now and get access to these sheets.